Okay, so um, uh, I, I didn't know what this meeting was about or what I was supposed to do, so um, I asked what's my assignment uh, in speaking to you tonight, and uh, what they told me was share my thoughts about what being a dyslexic has meant in my life. So that's what I'm going to try to do. So what is my life? What's my profession? I'm a professor at the University of California at Berkeley. But what's my passion? My passion is trying to discover how nature works. And my other passion is to help students uh, learn how to discover things themselves. And um, the part of nature that I try to learn about uh, is something probably a lot of you will resonate with. I'm, I'm interested in the physics of how organisms interact with the environment around them. And to do that, I can't just work in one field. I have to use some biology and some ecology and combine that with some physics and some engineering. So I'm drawing from all different sources to try to get the answers to these questions. And um, objectively, I feel like a jerk sh showing this because mostly I like to hide in the corner, but, but I have to sort of say, by the standards that the world set up, I've been pretty successful as a, a scientist using this wacky approach. And I'm particularly <laughs> proud that, that um, I got awards in, in different fields that I borrowed from to, to try to answer my questions. And so um, the most relevant of those awards to this meeting is that I um, uh, am a MacArthur Fellow, and um, those are those genius grants. And um, so uh, but they're awarded for being creative and wacky and innovative. And um, the other really relevant thing about this is it's because of the MacArthur Foundation that I learned that I was a dyslexic when I was 45 years old. And that's because of this wonderful man who's here, uh, Jack Horner. So he's... <laughs> so um, I met Jack at a MacArthur meeting, and then he was visiting Berkeley to look at some of the bones we've got at Berkeley, and uh, we went out to lunch. And by the time we'd navigated our way to the restaurant and, and ordered, he said, are you dyslexic? <laughs> and I said, why would you say that? I don't think so. Why did you say that? And he said, well, I watched you try to cross the street, and I watched you try to order, and, and um, I'm dyslexic, and I think you are. And, and so I just sort of filed that away, and I thought, well, okay. But then an interesting thing happened. The, um, they put new locks on our labs in our building, and instead of having a metal key, they had a keypad. Okay, right? You know what this means. I couldn't get into my lab. I had the numbers, and I'd try, and I'd try. And I thought, you know, maybe Jack is right. And so I, I, I went and I requested a metal key for my lab, and, uh, and they said, you can't have one. And I said, well, I think I'm dyslexic, and that's a disability, and the Americans with Disabilities Act applies to me. <laughs> <laughs> and so a metal key to my lab door would be my wheelchair ramp. And, and they said, if you can prove you're dyslexic, you can have a metal key. So I went off at age 45 and went through all those tests that kids now get when they're in school. But I did it then, and the lady said, not only are you visually dyslexic, you're auditorially dyslexic, and I've never seen anybody quite as bad as you. <laughs> so... <laughs> But, uh, but I was elated because suddenly a lot of things made sense to me. And so now that I know that I'm dyslexic, I want to go back and look at my path through uh, my studies and my, my life, and things make more sense now. And I am very grateful to have been invited to talk to this group because I hadn't done this exercise until I had to put this together. And um, part of the other assignment they gave me a little more specifically was describe my way of learning things and my way of doing things and describe what made those ways of doing things uh, let me be successful in my field. So I look way back to when I was a toddler and one of the things I realized is from the time I was tiny, 
I loved how water moved, especially because it's got a 3D structure and it changes with time. And that was always fascinating and fun to me. But what happened to me in school, I found this picture of myself my first day of school. And um, uh, this will be familiar to a lot of you. Languages, history, literature, those kinds of subjects had lots and lots of reading and I could never complete it in the amount of time between when it was assigned and we had to do something about it. And words and dates were impossible for me to memorize. So I had to work really, really, really hard and for long, long, long hours just to do okay in those classes and so I thought I was stupid. However, when you get a little further along in school and you start doing things like science, I found that science was really easy. What I figured out is if you understood the concepts and the basic principles, you could figure out the answer. And so I didn't have to read the book. And I didn't have to memorize anything. I could just go into an exam understanding it and get the answer right. And I thought I was cheating. <laughs> I thought you were supposed to memorize and, because I, and you were supposed to read the book. Now that I teach science, I realize that I was doing just what we want our students to do. But that was my perception about myself. And math, I learned, was fun once my dad taught me some tricks. And my dad, that's me and my dad, and he was a physics professor. And we had fun evenings after dinner sitting at the kitchen table doing math. And what he told me that was, it made it possible was, always leave a lot of space around every equation. Otherwise, it'll get scrambled. And it, that works. And what I realized <coughs> is that I think my dad was <laughs> dyslexic. <laughs> and, and I went, when I first got diagnosed, I went to one of these um, uh, seminars for adults with, uh, with learning disabilities, and they were teaching us all these tricks. And it was stuff like this. And I thought, my dad taught me every single one of those color code things, lots of space, draw lines, always use a ruler when you read, all that stuff. Um, so I think I, I got it genetically. And the other thing my dad was great about is he used to let me build stuff in his workshop. And um, so all that spatial stuff. But this was a long time ago, and it was before women's lib, and so the only thing that was suitable for a girl to build was doll furniture. So I was allowed to build doll furniture with my dad, which I just loved. But then as I got older, problems started arising, and that was that math and building stuff is what boys do, and I was a girl. And so even my wonderful father started discouraging me from doing math and science and building stuff. And my mother was an artist, and that's what girls do. And so that's the direction they pushed me, which was sort of okay, because it's spatial stuff. So I went off to college, and I had to major in art, but I went to a small liberal arts school where they had a lot of distribution requirements, so I had to take a science class. And I took biology, and what I realized in that biology class is that I was fascinated by natural form, and learning how it worked and what difference it made was much more exciting to me than just making images with it. So um, I switched to biology, much to my parents' horror, and then went on to get a, a PhD. <laughs> um, but um, this exercise of going down memory lane with dyslexia in mind made me haul out my old sketchbooks to see what I was looking at then. And one thing that was very good to learn is that it's really good I chose to be an artist, because I, I mean a scientist, because I wasn't a very good artist. But I noticed some patterns in my drawings that I think will be familiar to, to you guys. And this is a little embarrassing to put these up. but. Uh, one of the things is that I was really fascinated by the 3D-ness of form. And um, I was also very interested in structures like skeletons and also in material properties, what, how do hard things and soft things look and, and behave. And I was very interested in patterns of motion. And um, a lot of pictures had 3D-ness in the patterns of motion that I was trying to do. So even though they're crummy pictures, there were some 
uh, hints there about what, what I really was good at and thinking about. And so um, I want to show you one example from my research about how the ability to see structures in space and time helps me. And I'm doing this because I asked Jack, I said, what should I talk to these people about? They don't want to hear about me. And he said, just show them something you do and they'll get it. So that's what I'm going to try. So um, when an organism locomotes, running around or flying or swimming, it moves through the air or the water around it. So it's interacting with that fluid. And um, if that fluid is moving, which it does in the real world, the organism is in being buffeted by turbulence and wind and water currents and waves. And so what I want to understand is how does the interaction with that moving fluid affect the way the animal locomotes? And uh, so you can see this is my space and time and fluid and all that stuff coming together here. And the, um, the organisms I wanted to study this question for are little tiny things swimming in turbulent flow, so they're going to be buffeted a lot. This question wouldn't be very interesting for a whale. But I need a little tiny thing that needs to go somewhere specific. So let me introduce you to some very neat marine organisms. So if you look at stuff that lives on the bottom, we call those benthic, like corals and barnacles and snails and things, they can only disperse to new habitats by because they're glued down or walk really slowly, by releasing these little microscopic larvae that get wafted away in the ocean currents. But in order to become adults and survive, they have to settle back down onto the bottom in a suitable habitat. And where those larvae decide to settle back down on the bottom is really important ecologically for a couple of reasons we should care about. One is the dynamics and the genetics of populations all along the coast and in the ocean depend on where these things are able to uh, recruit. And also, if we look at one spot, like out here at Point Reyes, the composition of different species living together in a community on the shore is enormously affected by which of those little babies can settle there. So the question I wanted to ask, my spatial temporal question, is how do these little pipsqueak, lousy swimmers move from the water column down to the coral reef or the, the rocky shore when the waves and the turbulence and all of that stuff is, is going on? And there were two groups of scientists arguing about this. There was one group that said it's completely passive, and some of them are just lucky, and they bang into the shore. And the other group, who was studying things in beakers in the lab, not dyslexics, uh, still water, they said, oh, if I put chemicals in from stuff on the, on the shore, like a member of the same species or something uh, like its prey, then the larvae will, will undergo metamorphosis into the bottom-dwelling form. So this fight was going on. So uh, I, this is my, my animal that I studied. That, that thing that uh, sort of looks like a mop is actually a sea slug. It's about this big, and although it's pretty, it's a voracious predator, and it eats only one species of coral, uh, Parides compressa, and so that those larvae have to land on a reef where that particular kind of coral is uh, prevalent. There's a baby, it's about 200 microns long, just a fraction of an inch, microscopic, and those Mickey Mouse ears are its swimming organ, they're, they're ciliated. And we know uh, those, those non-dyslexics doing experiments in dishes in the lab have identified a particular perfume from the coral that makes the larvae um, uh, uh, settle onto the bottom. So um, we went out and measured that chemical in the field, but Again, being dyslexic and wanting to, to see things, I also did dye studies with fluorescent dyes in the field to see where the odors were. And you can see that the odors come leaching out of the coral and they're mixed around in the water into this big cloud. But another um, important thing about seeing things different ways is to see things at different scales. And so I'm big and you're big and that's how it looks to us. But what about something that's microscopic. And so um, what I wanted to know is what's the Q distribution like on the scale of that little tiny microscopic guy? And what tools as a scientist do I have to see that? And so here's what we did. 
So um, we have these big wave tanks where we can simulate the waves and the turbulence from the field. And what you see here, this black stuff on the bottom, or, or the benthic just means living on the bottom. Those are the corals and things living on the, on the bottom. And the water's flowing back and forth in the wave tank. And all those little dots are little hollow silver-coated glass beads that, that uh, don't sink or float in the water. So they move with it so I can now see the water. And when I do that, it looks like a snowstorm. But what I can do is shine a sheet of laser light through that snowstorm and look at one little slice at a time. And when I do that, then I can make a video just in a little tiny sl paper thin slice of that whole cloud and see what's going on. And we call that technique particle image velocimetry, PIV. That doesn't matter. But look at the cool things you can do. This is just one instant in time. And I've used those particles to calculate all those little arrows. And those little arrows show where the water is going. And the brighter and lighter they are, the faster it's going. So that scale on the sides shows that. Um, so that's what the water's doing at one snapshot in time. I also wanted to know what the smells were doing. And so I painted the bottom with a fluorescent dye that would slowly dissolve like the perfumes coming off the organisms. And I used a, a synchronized camera with a different filter on it to pick up just that color of fluorescence. And that's the gray stuff you see there. And so the brighter and lighter that gray filmy stuff in the background, the higher the concentration of the perfume. And so um, I want to show you how this spatially changes in time. And I think this is the part that Jack said you would get. So look at this is the world for a larva. So Look at how it changes in space and time. And um, it's not at all that big cloud that, that we, we think of as big organisms. So things change rapidly with time. And at any instant, spatially, there's quite a, a big uh, differences on very small scale. But still, we're sitting here watching this go by. I want you to think about being in that trying to swim while you're riding around in it. And again, that'll be easy for you to do. So this, let's just look at the odor. And you see the coral along the bottom. And then all that flamey stuff is just the, the odor illuminated by that little sliver of laser light. And so you can see it's not a cloud. It's very fine filaments. And if you look at that little tiny dot, that's about the size of a larva. Even though he's in the cloud, look at him. He's in black. That means he's in no odor at all. So what happens when he swims along through that and rides with it? So we did a bunch of experiments using little devices that are called microfluidics devices. And we can recreate an encounter with an odor plume. And what you saw is, I'll play it again. Um, Here's the larva. I had a, a student who was an art and science major who made this animation for me. It's swimming along. It runs into the odor, pulls in its Mickey Mouse ears, and sinks. And then when it leaves the perfume, out it comes again. So it's a stupid little on-off machine. So now I want to look at the world from, from that on-off machine's point of view so I, I can mathematically describe that behavior of swimming when it doesn't stink and sinking when it does. And I can embed that in my data and play the movie and calculate what happens to the larva. And then I can be the larva. I can ride with the larva through that field of odor and, and see what happens. So I'm going to sink in Q, and I'm going to swim when I'm out of Q, and I'm going to start up where that little air goes. And look what happens. Here's my path. So I'm going along, and, and uh, so this is all mathematically calculated based on what we know the larvae do. So that's, that's one guy. And so what do I see when I ride along as though I'm him? So I'm plotting here the concentration. So the higher the blips, the smellier the water. And I'm plotting it as a function of, of time. And here's that threshold. If, if the blips are higher than that line, he's going to sink. And if Below that line, he's going to swim. And look at this. If I'm the larva, I see the, the perfume, the Q. No Q. Q, no Q, Q, no Q, Q. It's on, off, on, off uh, as the larva swims along. And um, also, there's information. If I'm a larva uh, like that top picture where the big X is, 
I see Q every once in a while. If I get closer to the reef, look, I see it more often and more often and more often. And when I'm really close to where I want to be, um, I see it just about all the time. So I've used uh, our dyslexic's ability to think about space and time and put it together to become a microscopic organism and see the world the way it does. And um, what I can do is seed this world with thousands of these larvae and calculate what would happen uh, to them using this behavior and what would happen to them if they never pulled their Mickey Mouse ears and they just swam. And that model predicts that that stupid on-off behavior enhances the probability that those guys are going to land on the right coral reef by 20%. So the guys, the non-dyslexics working in beakers actually were right, but for the wrong reason. <laughs> <laughs> and does the fine scale matter? We can, we can uh, uh, calculate the transport rate of larvae into the, the reef my way where I pretend I'm the larva, I look at the very fine scale structure and I let it change from one instant to the next and I can do it the way everybody else has been doing it forever where it's just a big diffuse cloud like we big organisms experience when we look at, at the dye over the reef. And when I do that, what I find is if you do it the old fashioned way and you don't think about the little organisms, you're off by 15 to 20 percent. You get it wrong. So that's just an example I wanted to tell you about how the kind of thinking we do lets us put ourselves spatially and temporally in a different world from what other people can experience. And I really saw this, my, my wonderful and very patient husband who has to put up with me never remembering phone numbers and turning the wrong direction in the car all the time. He, he's a physical oceanographer and he and I collaborated on a project. And when we would sit down to talk and design experiments and calculations, that's what he said, right? That's how he thinks. He thinks in, in symbols, symbols that, that baffle us. And I would think this way, and we were saying exactly the same thing. And so it's just I want to celebrate both ways that minds work. Uh, we need them both. So. <laughs> And collaboration, I also want to say collaboration with normal people like my wonderful husband, allow us to translate the way we're thinking into ways like the mathematics he does allows those kinds of models that are really very powerful. So we, I think we need to, to not only celebrate our own minds, but figure out how to make our minds connect with minds that work other ways. It's a two-way street, and so that's one message I want to get across. And it turns out that my old art training and doll furniture building are still coming in handy now. I do all kinds of very wacky things in my research. And so lots of times I'll, you know, if you, I want to change how an organism moves or what its shape is, uh, lots of times nature doesn't provide an organism like that, so I build one. And so I <laughs> make robots and do experiments with them and that sort of thing. And what you see here, these are, uh, I don't know how many of you have seen these wonderful feathered dinosaurs, articles about them that they're digging up in China. And uh, I mostly put this in for, for Jack. So uh, I've built, you know, they're, they're dead, but why not study their physics anyway? And so I've built these feathered dinosaurs and we fly them in the wind tunnel and we've learned that those feathers, uh, again, everybody thinks that, th that if you're a flying machine, you want to generate a lot of lift and go a long way horizontally before you hit the ground. But what we learned is a lot of this stuff has to do with maneuvering and turning and moving between the trees. And we wouldn't have learned that if we hadn't built our little guys and flown them in the wind tunnel. So I'm going to end by trying to summarize the ways that dyslexia helped me. One is I can't read, I can't memorize, and so the only way I can learn things is to understand them. And that has really helped me as a scientist. Uh, I'm confused by jumbles of symbols. And the net result is that I'm really slow when I have to do a calculation or put my data in the spreadsheet or whatever, but I'm really careful. And so I think in the end, I make fewer mistakes, just like you, you're doing really well in your reading course. Um, you know, uh, I'm bad at this, but I know it, and therefore I'm careful. Lack of confidence. I think is an asset. I 
went for 45 years thinking I was stupid and working harder than everybody else just to stay, keep a pace. And I think that's good because I know I have to work harder. So being lacking confidence, I think, has been a help to me. And the other thing is because I lack confidence, what I do doesn't matter. Who cares? And that gives me enormous freedom to be creative. And I, it was especially helpful for me when I was younger because not only was I stupid, but I was a girl. And so for both those reasons, nobody would take me seriously. So I, I didn't have to compete and be the smartest scientist in the department. I could do my thing, and my thing turned out to work okay. <laughs> and then the last thing <laughs> is, <laughs> is um, that that a lot of us are very good at 3D spatial thinking and at seeing um, temporal patterns that other people don't see or seeing scales that other people don't see. And um, for me, that has made it easy for me to couple physics and biology in my work. And so I'll just stop here and 